that this debate takes place and 100,000 people gathered. I don't know how sound was carried on those days because there was no mi microphones and no loudspeakers. But perhaps people vicariously, you know, from the distance they can see and they can hear something and people pass it on and say, Molly Sabna, you mara, and founder, ye kaha, you know, something like this, like that. It's a game, an uppercut, and everybody is satisfied. So the debate starts. With the reverend suggesting to the Maulana, said, Maulana Saheb, get started. In Urdu, get started. Shuru ki jay. So the Maulana responded that you see, you are our elder brother. Christianity preceded Islam by 600 years. As such, you are 600 years of a senior. And according to our culture, you have the first preference. Secondly, you are our guest. You are our guest. No doubt an unwelcome guest, but a guest at that. And according to our culture, you have the first preference. So the reverend founder was forced to start the debate. And he started with a question. It was all worked out. In Urdu, said Maulana Saheb, respected Maulana, where is your Prophet Muhammad now, this moment? Where is he? So the Maulana thought for a moment and he said that he's in Jannatul Firdaus, heavenly bliss with Allah Bari Ta'ala. Out of that answer came the second question. He said, all right, all right, Maulana Saheb, Tell us, where was he when his grandson Hussein was martyred at Karbala? Where was he then? See, the Maulana again thought for a moment and he said he was still in Jannatul Firdaus, heavenly bliss with Allah Bari Ta'ala. Out of that answer came the third question. It was all worked out, prepared. He said, all right, all right, tell us now, Maulana Saheb, that if your prophet was with his Allah, in heaven, when his grandson Hussein was being butchered, martyred at Karbala, didn't he ask his Allah for help? Ya bari ta'ala, look what they're doing to my grandchild, please help him out of his difficulty. Didn't he cry out for help to Allah? And there was a long pause. Long pause. And the reverend couldn't hold his peace. He says, come on, come on, started banging his feet, come on, come on. Didn't he ask his Allah for help? So the Maulana said, yes, he did. And so what did he say? What did Allah say? Because we know he was in help. What did he say? And there was an inordinate pause, an extra long pause. And again, the reverend couldn't hold his peace, started stamping his feet, said, come on, come on. He thought he had the kill and the people also felt ke Maulana ne maradia. Maulana got us chopped off. Khatam kar adia hume. Says, come on, come on. So the Maulana says that Allah cried. Allah ne rodiya. So what? Allah cried? He says, yes, Allah cried. He says, I couldn't save my own son, Jesus. How can I save your grandson? <laughs> and the debate was over. And the debate was over. You see, it was only a matching of the wits. It has nothing to do with facts. This is one trying to be cleverer than the other. As the saying goes, that twice armed is he whose cause is just. If you are on the right path, your strength is double because you know you're fighting for your rights. Twice armed is he whose cause is just. But thrice armed is he who gets in first. Like our Jewish cousins every time, you know. We go into battle in 48, the guy gave us a hand. 56, he gave us a knock out. 67, another knock. For the first time, the Muslims took the initiative, was in 1973. And again, with the help of America, the Jews were able to, to restrain us. See? But the guy is getting in first. So, he, now, you are in the right. But the guy gets in first. He knocks you out, he knocks you out, he knocks you out. So, the reverend was knocked out. The debate was over. But this is the type of things that they were doing. And as a result of that, we have contact with this country because they ruled our country. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. You are all speaking English. You're listening to me speaking to you in English. Why? Because they came and ruled us for over a hundred years. If the French were ruling us, we'd be speaking French. If the Portuguese had ruled us, we'd be speaking Portuguese. 
If the Spanish were ruling us, we'd be speaking Spanish. Can't you see? You are all English-speaking people. What for? Because they ruled us. They are the one who created us, that we can talk to them in their own mother tongue now. Another example from this book, I had another confrontation. You see, the Christian missionaries, they have the patience and the perseverance to follow up any opportunity. Unlike the Muslims, you see, you have an argument, a debate, a discourse with a non-Muslim, and you seem to have got him cornered. What do you do? You start going around boasting, say, well, you know, I had him fixed up, man. I shut him up. Finish. You're satisfied. Not the Christian. He will follow you up day in and day out, day in and day out until you are converted. Or you say, hey, don't darken my door again. Otherwise, I'll put a bullet through you. I'll put a knife through you. That you haven't got the guts to say that. Nor am I expecting you to do that. But unless you say that, that guy will never let you go. You give him a finger, he'll catch you by the hand, he'll never let you go. They have the patience and the perseverance which we haven't got. Shame on us. Shame on us. So, this Christian missionary got stuck into an Arab sheikh. Day in and day out. Preaching to him that you're wasting your time, ya sheikh. Pray five times a day, up and down, up and down. You fast for one whole month and you straightjacket your life. You don't drink, you don't gamble, you don't eat the pig and on and on. Allah is not hungry for that. You want salvation? You believe that he sent his son into the world and he died for your sins and salvation is yours. God Almighty, he came down to earth and he died for your sins. Believe and be saved. And he won't let go. Every day he's there. Every day he's there. He's making life miserable for this poor Arab sheikh. How is he to get out of the difficulty? So he plans a strategy. He tells his, his prime minister, his wazir, he said, look man, tomorrow when he comes, I want you to whisper something in my ears. Okay. He said, yes. That's all. And the missionary came. Assalamu alaikum. So the Arab, as usual, ahlan wa sahlan, beautiful words of welcome. The most beautiful words of welcome in any language. Ahlan wa sahlan. Just think that you are a member of the family and sahl be at ease. If you want to pick your nose, you may do so. Like in the army, say, stand at ease. Now you can do what you like. Ahlan wa sahlan. So the guy sits down and he starts. Same old story. So the the, the minister comes along and whispers something in the races, in the chief's ears. And the chief begins began to cry, like a woman who's lost her husband. He, he started to cry. <laughs> so the priest wants to know, what's wrong? What has happened? He <laughs> said, so don't talk. He said, come on, man, come on, please tell. tell us. You know, we may sympathize with you. <laughs> you can't. He's crying, crying. Acting, actually he's acting. So the priest is more eager to know what has happened, what's the sad news. So he said, you know, I just got the sad news that Akhi Jibreel, Jibreel alayhi salam, the Archangel Gabriel, he died. Mamat, marge, Jibreel alayhi salam, marge. So the priest says, you fool, angels don't die. So the Arab sheikh says, and you fool, you telling me that God died? Now see, this is the type of arguments that have been carrying on. But now they are becoming more sophisticated. You see, here is a book. The subject of this evening's talk. The challenge of Islam. This one says in South Africa, but the challenge of Islam is everywhere. Because Islam is the only faith which claims for this honor, this status, you see there are only two religions really on the face of the earth which are competing for the hearts and minds of mankind. Only two, really. Two missionary religions, Christianity and Islam. They are the only two religions which are out to change people. So Islam claims to confirm, to correct, complete and supersede Christianity. It's the only religion which claims that. The Hindu would tell the Christian, he said, look man, you be a good Christian and I'll be a good Hindu. Leave me alone. The Buddhist will tell him, he said, look, you be a good Christian, I'll be a good Buddhist. Leave me alone. Not so the Muslim. 
the Muslim is told to tell him that God is one God, is not three in one. He's made to say, the Muslim is made to say, so look, don't eat the pig, don't drink alcohol, don't gamble, don't be promiscuous. Shh. At every step, he is coming into confrontation with the Christian way of life. He is a challenge. He is a challenge. And like in South Africa, for 300 years, the Christians have been hammering at our people. 300 years. The first people that went there, they were taken there, were the, the people, a group of people in my country, in South Africa, called Malays. See, when the Dutch, when they conquered Indonesia, those of our brethren who were fighting for their freedom, they were captured as prisoners of war and shipped to the Cape of Good Hope and sold to the white men as slaves. Then when the British, your people here, when they conquered Malaysia, those of our brethren who were fighting for their freedom, they were captured as prisoners of war and shipped to the Cape of Good Hope, Good Hope for the white man, and sold to the white man as slaves. For 300 years, these people are being hammered to have them Christianized. But after 300 years of hammering, they came out one of the most militant Muslim communities in the world, the Malays of the Cape. One of the most militant Muslim communities. They failed to change them. As a matter of fact, they multiplied beyond the normal rate of increase. The Malays. And then the Indian Muslims for about 150 years, we are there. We went there because we are starving in India. Famines, famines, famines. So we went to eke out a living, our fathers. And they had the fantastic opportunity of converting us. Poor, illiterate, ignorant, hungry people. That's my people. But they failed. And today, as this Christian missionary shows in this book, the challenge of Islam, mosques after mosques. Mosques, we have more than 300 masjids in the country. And each and every one is a masterpiece without any Arab help, except for one. There's only one mosque that the Arabs helped. Otherwise, all these 300 masjids, with our own sweat and toil, we build the masjids. And we have created a community there. Alhamdulillah, we have nothing to be ashamed of. We supply more tablighis to the tablighi jamaat than India or Pakistan on a percentage basis. South Africa. We send more hajjis for hajj on a percentage basis than most Arab countries. More of our people keep beards than any other people anywhere else. More of our people go for salat than anywhere anybody else going to the masjid. We are a fantastic community in South Africa. And in an ocean of Christianity, we are a challenge to the Christian. So, he is bent on wanting to change us. And he has now increased his tempo. And he is succeeding. He has developed new techniques. You see, at first they were attacking Islam. Muhammad was an imposter. He had so many wives. He, he copied his book from the Jews and the Christians, on and on. And that didn't gather honey. Now they have developed new techniques. And new, new plans are afoot for our destruction. Here is a Christian magazine called Pray, Pray. You see, when the Christian says pray, it doesn't mean pray. It means give. Because when you talk, you say, oh, for our Lord Jesus, Africa for Christ, Afri Asia for Christ. They pray. That means with that they give money. The Muslim is very quick to pray for you. He says, ah, dua kijiye, to dua kar diye, Allah aapko hazar baras ki umar de de. And I'll give you a thousand years. <laughs> One, one man, he gave me such a great blessing. He says, you know, Mr. D. Dad, I'm prepared to give the rest of my life to you. Rest of his life. He's prepared to give it to me. You know what that means? He's prepared to die now. Suppose he's got another 20 years balance. He's prepared to give me the 20 years and he's prepared to die now. Because, you know, it doesn't work that way. He won't give me five cents, five pennies. But he's prepared to give me the balance of his life. Muslim is very good at that. He's prepared to give something which he hasn't got. The rest of his life is for you. You can have it. <laughs> the Christian, when he says pray, he means give. And the guys give. Wallah, they give. So here in this magazine, this is a Chinese gentleman or a Korean. In the picture here, his name is John Lee. He's speaking about the kingdom of oil. Automatically in your mind, Saudi Arabia. No, no, kingdom of oil. Who is he talking about? Saudi Arabia. And he says here, 
in the first paragraph, he said, I am in Saudi Arabia, just left Kuwait. This enemy of God can get into Kuwait, he can get into Saudi Arabia, whereas you can't. There are certain difficulties we have. He says here, I could think of no better or no more important time to give a lot of attention to the Muslim world than now. Now is the time. The world, the gospel has scarcely been shared. It is very simply a virgin land, ready to be plowed. Preparation is underway in Pakistan. For the last two years, we have been in contact with six key leaders in the Arab Muslim world to come up with a realistic and workable plan for every home crusade, door to door. This year, we plan to open a research center in Beirut, Lebanon, to start the preparation for the entire Arab Muslim world, and on and on. Muslim world, Arab Muslim world, Arab Muslim world, Arab Muslim, in this small article, more than half a dozen times, Muslim world, Muslim world, Arab Muslim world, they are interested in our salvation. The poet says, Vatan ki fikra karna da, musibat aane wali hai, teri barbadiyon ke mashwire hai asmano mein. So think, O oh ignorant one, think of your people, your nation, your community, your ummah. For preparations are afoot in the hierarchies of the world for your destruction. But the Muslim is complacent. He is alright. In Pakistan, we are a hundred million. Yeah, that's the mentality. In Bangladesh, we are so many percent. In Libya, we are ninety-nine percent Muslim. This is, this is your pride. They are planning our destruction. Here is a book, cover of a book. Sound the Alarm from Saudi Arabia. Written by Tom Griffith. Who is the man? He stayed in Jeddah for 10 years studying the Arabs. And now he's written a book telling them how to do the job. How to get at the Arab. If they won't allow you door to door, there are other ways and means. And here are the other ways and means. This is a photostat of a cover of an envelope, dateline from Wolverhampton, from UK. Address to the manager, Sand Supermarket, PO Box 7867, Sharafiya, Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Inside is a coupon in Arabic. And in this coupon, they're offering the Saudi free Injil in Arabic. So wouldn't you like to have it, you beggars? Wouldn't you like to have a free Injil? Have you seen one? He says, no. Didn't your sheikh, your alim, didn't he show you? He says, no. He says, look, we give you one free. Bakshish. Free Injil. Another one. This, they, they get addresses from the directories, telephone directories, and they start sending Injil, free Injil, to the Arabs. They can't go door to door. You won't allow us, and now we get in through the post, and we get in through the radio. A small group of people among the Christians, they call themselves Jehovah's Witnesses. They do not number two million in the world today. That little group of people published one book, only one book I'm referring to, The Truth. The title of the book, The Truth That Leads to Eternal Life. They printed 84 million copies of this one book in 95 languages. 84 million copies of one book in 95 languages. What language would you like to read? Arabic is there. Gujarati is there. Urdu, what language? Zulu, Swahili, what? Malayalam, what do you want to read? 84 million copies of one book in 95 languages. And that book is not a booklet. It's not a booklet, you know, a small book. Is 192 pages. You know the whole Muslim world put together. With all our petrol dollars, we can't produce a million sheets for propagation. You know that? Million sheets like this you can't produce. With all our petrol dollars, with all the thousand million Muslims in the world put together, we can't produce a million sheets of paper. Do you know that? A nation like that, a community like that, ummah like that. Deserves to get lost. Deserves to be destroyed. Can't you see? One little group, this is what it does. That little group, again, produces a magazine called the Watchtower. This is the beautiful cover. This is not the magazine, it's only a cover. Watchtower magazine. And they tell us, average printing, each issue, 12,315,000 each printing a month of the magazine. 
12,315,000 a month. That same group of people, another magazine called Awake. Wake up! Allah told us to wake up. Allah says, Ya ayyuhal muddathir kum fa'anzir. So thou wrapped up in a mantle, arise and deliver thy warning. We were told to wake up. They have woken up. Awake! This magazine, they tell you, average printing, 10,610,000 a month. 10,610,000 a month. What am I trying to do? Trying to frighten you? Terrify you? No, I want you to realize that the world is planning for your destruction. But you are complacent. Ah, we are all right. We pray five times a day and we are all right. I say, you are not all right. We haven't fulfilled the purpose for which Allah has sent us into this world. This is sit down, have a good time, earn a good living, have a good house, pray five times a day, it completes our duty as a Muslim. No! The duty of the Muslim is to share, to share this deen with the rest of mankind. This is your awwal fard, is the first fard of the Muslim. Long before Salat, Zakat and Hajj became fard, Allah Ta'ala tells his prophet and through him he's telling us. He says, Fazakir innama anta muzakir. So you, you deliver the message. Because it is your duty to deliver the message. Lasta alayhim bi musaitir. You will not be questioned regarding them. Illa man tawalla wa kafar. Why they accepted or why they didn't accept. Allah won't ask you. He will ask you, did you deliver the message? Long before Salat, Zakat, Hajj and Saum became fard, Allah tells us, this is your job. Go and deliver the message. We are satisfied that, well, we are, you know, praying five times a day and we are good Muslims and on and on. We don't eat the pig and we don't drink. Alhamdulillah. This doesn't absolve us from the duties and responsibilities Allah has put upon us. Another small group of people, unheard of people, they publish this magazine called The Plain Truth. One family, Armstrong family, Herbert Armstrong, Ted Garner Armstrong. Average printing, this one here, 8,175,000 a month free, free, four color job. 8 million a month free. Now they're offering you the Holy Bible. Here. A Christian gift free to all Muslims. Not to all Hindus or to the Jews. No, no, to all Muslims. Free. Just for you, free. Wouldn't you like to have it? And now, this beautiful book here. Look at this. The title is, No Greater Love. Any young man or young woman would like to read it. No greater love. With a beautiful color, rose, four color job, cover, beautiful. They have been sending this free to all Muslims. No greater love. Every young man laps it up. Lap it up. <laughs> Something love romance, true love, true romance. Wouldn't you like to read it? You know what this is? You know what it is? This is the New Testament. So far, they gave out 2,750,000 free of charge by post. 2,750,000 have been given out. That's the figure inside. Free! For us beggars. They know that the beggary mentality that you have says you'll take it. This is what they're doing for you. What are we doing for them? Nothing. Nothing. We are satisfied. We are all right. And they have you in mind. Well, this particular one speaks about Birmingham. You're not far from Birmingham, are you? No. Here, it's from Christian production from the magazine. The title of this message is, England, England, the Muslims are coming. So look at them, see? The Muslims are coming. At one time they say the Turks are coming. You know, they were knocking at the gates of Vienna. The Muslims are coming. They went and conquered Spain. Now, the Muslims are making a second invasion. The Muslims are coming. You, you, you. They are terrified of you. You have come back to collect your interest now. Hmm? They ruled you for 150 years. What have you come to do here now? Collect your interest. So they are coming. There is a team. They call themselves the Crusaders. And they found, they were called international crusades, crusades. But crusade is a sensitive word. 
as soon as the Muslim hears it, uh huh, this is a second crusade. You know, they had this, for 200 years, they led crusades against the Muslims from here, all over Europe, into Palestine. For 200 years, they kept on crusades after crusades. Now, there is another crusade on. But this, is, this word crusade is very sensitive. The Muslim is sensitive to such a word. So they change the term, change the name, from international crusades to international teams. Very nice, kind people. Innocent. Team. What? Football team? Tennis team? Crochet? What? What team? So innocent. Bridge? Playing bridge? Or chess? What? Team. International team. And they are now t telling us here, they're telling the Christians, of course, not us. We just stumbled across this. It says, our goal is to field an English-speaking team, not Crusaders, to Birmingham to work amidst the 25,000 Bengali Muslims. First, the first thing, Bengali Muslims. Why Bengali Muslims? Because the fellow is nice and soft and kind. Easy meat, like the Indonesians. Nice, soft and kind. They already perverted 15 million of them into Christianity. Nice and kind, soft and sweet. They love them. They love you. And they tell you what, what to do, how to get their men and how to get their women. Why Birmingham? He said, Birmingham is the center of England. And from Birmingham, the whole of England. And from Birmingham, the whole of Europe. Birmingham should be the center of the Crusades. In my country, the saying, Jesus is the answer. And now they have Muslims, Murtads, preaching to Muslims. Diamond cuts diamond. Names? <laughs> Murtad, Muslims. Reverend Ahmad Sabji. Reverend Ahmad Sabji is becoming a reverend now. Here, another guy here, Shabir Wadi. You know, the Gujarati fellows, I'm a Gujarati. See, we say, oh, our people are all right. You know, we are, we are exempt. I said, look, this guy, Shabir Wadi, is your nation. You Gujarati fellow is your nation. Shabir Wadi has become a Murtad. Another guy, Ibrahim Muhammad. Another one, Khayat Allah. See, another one, Si Murad. Salim Adam. Another Kanamya, which is from Kanam Jilla. Murtad, 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 apostate, apostate, apostate. And they're using them to preach to the Muslims. I say it's working. They have courses, special courses for us. They call it Muslim evangelism. Actually, it's Christian evangelism, but see the Noma. They say Muslim evangelism. They say here, training course to all Christians who are interested in witnessing to Muslims. Muslims, do shahada to the Muslim. This course will teach you about Islam as a religion, as well as practical ways to evangelize Muslims, how to convert them to Christianity. They will teach you Islam as a religion. You know what it is? You see, they say Christianity is not a religion. Islam is a religion. Christianity is not. So what is, what is this? He says, you see, Islam is a religion, do's and don'ts. Don't drink, don't gamble, don't dance, pray five times a day, do fasting. That's a religion. Christianity is a relationship with God. You know, you become one bosom pal with Him. Once you become one with Him, you can play the fools around with Him, because He's like your bosom pal, like your sweetheart. It's a relationship you create with God, not religious religion. Religion tells you, hey, do this, don't do that. If you don't do this, Allah will punish you. If you do this, Allah will punish you. That's religion. So they teach you, say, look, these guys are wasting their time. They're killing themselves. Five times a day, up and down, up and down, fasting for one whole month. Is God hungry for that? No, man, he's made things easy for you. You just believe that God Almighty came down to earth and he died for you. Believe and be saved. That's, that's relationship and methods of getting at us. New, new techniques. Look at this, if you find this anyway. Al-Kitab, beautiful, look at this. Al-Kitab. If any Muslim gets this, immediately in your mind, if you know a little bit of the Quran, you think, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِي That's automatically, it comes into your mind. These are words. Phrases, you know, leading on to something. 
No, this got nothing to do with the Quran, though it's Islamic calligraphy. This is to catch the Muslim fish. The Muslim will bite for this. And they caught me. Can you imagine? This old man, this old man. I'm supposed to be a guy in the know. You know that? You give me that credit. No, it's a little better than you in this field. I'm not talking about piety, goodness. Mm -hmm. I'm only talking about this talking about religion, arguing, debating. I'm a little better than you. No? Yes. There's nothing to be ashamed of. And I got caught in Karachi, Pakistan. I delivered the lecture. At the end of the lecture, people are flogging, flocking around. They want to shake hands. They want to get the blessings. They want to make life miserable for me. They love me so much. They kill me with love. But I can't help it. I'm giving my hand. And there comes a young boy, about 11 or 13 year old, bareheaded, and he gives me this. Just like that, like this. Shh, something beautiful. Wallah, beautiful. If you can only see it at close quarters, beautiful. And I read, Allah Muhammad. I wanted to kiss it, but the people are not giving me a chance, so I put it in my pocket. Next day, I was leaving for Dubai. I had no chance to take them out. In Dubai, in my hotel, I said, now let me clear my pocket. So I take it out. I read Allah Muhammad. I see there's something in gold, a sticker, beautiful sticker, for children put in the Quran. Sabana, Abana, I think it's Rabbana. This is the mind, the mind. You just see something, you think, Rabbana, Atina, Fiddunya, maybe this is some dua, MashaAllah, and another one here. And you can. then I turn. Upside down, and I see there, this is the Lord's Prayer. I was thinking that the Pakistanis beat me. Hmm. You know, I'm doing a great job of work in my country. Wallah, it's great. The type of literature that I produce, world class, free, free, free. What I'm doing, fantastic job. But I said the Pakistanis beat me. But I'm not ashamed of that. I'm happy that these brothers of mine, they beat me. They can produce this for giving it to children, to giving it to people. Wallah, alhamdulillah, great. But the Lord's Prayer, I said, we don't talk like that, do we? Never talk like that. We say Surah Fatiha, the opening chapter. We never say Lord's Prayer. What is this? I look again. Now I'm trying to decipher this Arabic calligraphy, Muslim calligraphy. He says, no, this is, O oh, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will, in Arabic, in Arabic. And this, Allah Muhammad. Anybody I'm showing, so what's this? It's Allah Muhammad. I don't know, it's a bit far from you. But everybody says, what is this? It's Allah Muhammad. Can you see? From what you see? Yes. I showed it to an Arab Sheikh in Jeddah. I said, Ya Sheikh, have a look at this. He said, Allah Muhammad. I said, Ya Sheikh, have another good look. He said, Allah Muhammad. I said, Ya Sheikh, please, have a good look. Then say, Allah Muhabba. Allah Muhabba. God is love. That is what the Christians say. See, but making Muslims today, put it in the house, put it in the Quran. They're catching fish. Muslim fish. See, they know how to catch fish. The fisherman knows the type of bait you're supposed to use for certain type of fish. Every fish doesn't buy the same bait. They know this Muslim fellow here. <laughs> they know he loves Allah's kalam. He loves Islamic calligraphy. The Muslim. Anyway, they have been watching us. They have been studying us, the psychologists. In India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, wherever, in Africa, they watch the Muslim. That if they see anything written in Arabic, strewn around, the Muslim child picks it up, kisses it, and puts it in the Quran. No. That's we. We are taught to love and respect Allah's kalam. And we see things lying down in Arabic. To us, the only thing that is in Arabic that we ever saw is Allah's kalam. So anything we see in that calligraphy is Allah's kalam. It can be Lady Chatterley's lover in Arabic. Torn and thrown around. Try. And you'll find the Muslim children picking up, kissing it. It could be Arabian Nights. Huh? Book on pornography in Arabic. Strewn around. Our children will pick it up. And you too. You grown up old man. You too. You'll pick it up. Kiss it, put it in the pocket, take it home, put it in the Quran. No? Yes, that's how we are trained. So they have been studying you. So they know this fish, what it'll bite. So they're catching the fish. This is all for you. 
My dear brothers and sisters, this is all for you. I'll give you a bigger one. This is all for you. This is Islamic calligraphy. If this was given outside, when you go out, you know, you, you, if there's somebody was giving out, you know, each and everyone, you'll rush, you know, you'll be stampede, you'll break the queue, and you'll break people's heads to get this. No? Free. Yes. Yes, I know. That's my people. That's me. Look, look at this. Look at this. What's all this? This is Christian. This is the Bible. These are the Bible. Bible verses of the Bible. To catch this fish, this Muslim is going to bite this. They know how to catch fish. Books. Books they give out to our people. Books. Look at this. Christian witness among Muslims. You see a man here, looks like a Nigerian or a Sudanese. With this turban. He's got a tasbih, a subhi, in his hand. You know, we say subhanallah, subhanallah. He's got it in his hand. And it's written at the bottom here. Inna allaha yubashiru ki bi kalimatim minhu ismuhul masih wa isa ibn maryama. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? Kiss it? Yes, Allah's kalam. And put it next to the Quran. You know what is this? A snake in the house. This is a snake in the house. This is a Christian missionary book, but you can't tear it, you can't throw it, you can't burn it. He's caught you because he's got Allah's kalam. They know how to catch fish. Here is somebody, our one who looks like our brother of the Tablighi Jamaat. No insult. Wallah, no insult to anybody. He looks like a man, full-grown beard with a Zulfa. You know Zulfa has long hair. And his name is K.K. Alawi. Muslim. K.K. Alawi. He is a murtad. He has now opted for, he's a Christian. But he's got the nice lovely beard and nice Zulfa. And his name is K.K. Alawi. And you read, you open the book. Verses of the Quran, verses of the Quran, verses of the Quran. What do you do? Kiss it and put it next to the Quran. Another snake in the house. They know how to catch fish. Here, why I became a Christian? Sultan Muhammad Paul. Sultan Muhammad, he's become now Paul. Open the book. He's a Pathan, Pathan. The Pathan fellow said, Now we are right. I said, You're Pathan, this is Pathan. And the Punjabi fellow told me, I said, Look, I'll show you this guy, this new uh, Archbishop from Pakistan. Who is he? Find out. He must be another Punjabi fellow, who is another Murtad, he is an Archbishop. He is a Bishop from Pakistan, in that Lambeth conference he was here. Muslim fellow, who has become a Murtad. You open the book, verses of the Quran. What you do? Kiss it. Put it next to the Quran. Another snake in the house. They are masters at the game. Here, from Sufism to Christ. John Abdul Subhan, Abdul Subhan. Subhanallah, he has now become John. He is a Bishop now. This is all for you. <laughs> books after books. Jesus, more than a prophet. Here, when I showed this to Dr. Muharram of the Central Mosque, this book here, it says, A Christian's Response to Islam. See this picture here in multicolor? This is the Regent's Park Mosque. So he tells me, this is our mosque. I said, yes. But I said, you didn't print it? This is the Christians are printing this. Your mosque, look. The mosque is yours. So make it easy for you to, ah, this is beautiful, mashallah. <laughs> I like to have it. You don't only like to have it? Hmm? Is your masjid? MashaAllah. The Great Commission, you and the Muslims. Your Muslim guest. You're, you, you are the guest. Whether you are a student, whether you are an expatriate, whatever you are, you are the guest. And now, how to take advantage of this guest? How to go? Man, so many advantages they say they have now against you. There are certain advantages they didn't have before. They have against you. Either you are a student, whether you are working here, you are living here, whatever. You are a nice target, beautiful target. So they say. He said, you see, previously, when we wanted to preach to these people, the Muslims, we had to leave our homes, comfortable homes, and go to foreign lands, India, go to Indonesia, Malaysia, Africa, thousands of miles away from our home. Now we can work from a home base. We can sleep with our wife and children and we can go and knock at people's doors from a home base. You don't have to go thousands of miles away to go and preach. You are here, ready for them, ready customers. Number one. Number two. He said, you see, when we went to foreign lands, 
India, poor country, you go to the villages, you have to sit on the floor on the mat, flies are buzzing, the smoke is coming from the kitchen, his eyes are smarting, nose is watering. Huh? Yes. Now, he said, these people are ready to receive the nice, comfortable, and tea and cake they have, just like us. So when we go, we are at home. Culturally, you are ready to receive the message, far more than your brothers and sisters in India or Pakistan. Two. Three. He said, you see, when we went out before, we had to learn the native's language. You have to learn your language, whether Bengali or Punjabi or Sindhi or Gujarati. They had to learn your language to preach to you. Now you have learned his language. How beautiful. Look, you are ready to receive the message. Look, are you listening to me? You understand what I'm talking in English? Yes, so you are ready to receive the Englishman's message. The Christian's message, same. Same language. He doesn't have to learn your language. No matter what language you speak at home, Urdu or Punjabi or Sindhi, he doesn't have to learn all that. He speaks to you in English. So you have learned his language. Linguistically, now you are ready to receive the message. Previously, when they converted any one of us in our motherland, in a village or a town, he becomes like a sore thumb. Everybody sees that guy going and says, that murtad, kafar, mardud, you know, he's a traitor. No, you make him out, there goes the traitor, there goes the traitor. You feel like strangling him. Today, he can get lost in the majority. There are 60 million Englishmen. Among them, uh, one convert and another convert, he can easily digest it. He doesn't stand out anymore as a sore thumb. Previously, the governments were against your conversion. Pakistan doesn't like it. There are missionaries making inroads into the country. There are 200,000 Christians in Sialkot on the border with India, a potential fifth column of Do Lakh. There are 72 Christian units working in, 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 around Peshawar, Rawalpindi, Quetta. 72 Christian missions in the guise of service to the people, the Mujahideen and the Muhajireen are being converted to Christianity. The government knows, but they can do nothing about it. As against that, there are only six Muslim groups. Only six against 72 of the Christians. The Muslim is not aware. He doesn't care. He's blaming the government. The government doesn't like it. I'm not trying to defend anybody. The government doesn't like it, but can do nothing about it. But here, the government is happy. They want to absorb you. They're happy. The government is happy to have you become one of them. That you also become a pig eater. You also become a, a wine bibber. Yeah, they'll be happy. They're happy with you becoming one with them. No? Yes. Five points. Which they didn't have before, they have you now. Advantage. And they're working. They're working. Books. Christ put key in your hand. They are Muslim in the masjid. Allah or the God of the Bible. Come on, which will you have? Share your faith with the Muslim. They have printed, according to Professor Edward Said, he is a Lebanese Christian, Professor Edward Said of the Columbia University in America. He says, uh, this is from the News Times magazine, he says, early Christian polemicists, people who argue in debate against Islam, use the prophet's human person as their butt, something to hit against, accusing him of whoring, accusing our Nabi of whoring, zinakori, astaghfirullah, charlatan, sedition, charlatry, as writing about Islam and the Orient burgeoned, 60,000 books have been written between 1800 and 1950. In 150 years, they wrote more than 60,000 books against Islam. And the Muslim says, leave them alone. What do you want to interfere with them? They are nice people. Sheep and goats ready for slaughter. Yeah, again, this is Newsweek. It tells us that today, more than 60% of the world's 70,000 missionaries are Americans. There are 70,000 crusaders, mujahids of Christianity, raising the dust in the world. These are priests, ministers of the church, parsons. No, 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 no. These are the mujahids of Christianity. They are out to change the world. Out of the 70,000, 60% are Americans. I worked it out. 42,000 Americans are raising the dust in the world today. The Muslim says, leave him alone. He's a nice fight. Kind chap, you know. 
Why? Why are you bother him? Leave him. I said, look, Allah doesn't leave him. Allah is telling us in the Quran that they will not be satisfied with you. You Muslims, no man what you say. You say you believe in Jesus. Jesus was one of the mightiest messengers of God. We say he was the Messiah, the Messiah. We say he was born miraculously. We say he gave life to the dead by God's permission. And he healed those born blind and the lepers by God's permission. Does that satisfy them? No. Allah says, وَلَن تَرْضَى أَنْكَ الْيَهُودُ وَلَن نَصَارَى حَتَّى تَتَّبِعَ مِلَّتَهُمْ They will never, never be satisfied with you, Muslim. Don't be fools. Unless you become one of them. Become a Roman Catholic, the Roman Catholic will be satisfied. Become an Anglican, the Anglican will be satisfied. Become a Seventh-day Adventist, then they will be satisfied. They will never be satisfied with you unless you join the church. It's either you get lost with them, change them. Change them or get changed. There's no other way. What is the answer to all this? The answer is, ah, this book of God, the Quran. We have to acquaint ourselves with this book. We don't know. Wallah, we don't know the book. We only hear. We are prepared to die for this book. If they insult the book, we can raise rebel from here and say, come on, we'll march on to the city hall or town hall and we'll do this and do that. And the parliament house, but the Muslim is prepared to do that. He's prepared to die for this book. But he knows nothing about the book. He is not prepared to live by it. He doesn't know what it says. Nothing. He's prepared to die for it, but he's not prepared to live for it. Because he doesn't know what it says. He doesn't know. Wallah, he doesn't know. Bulk of us, we know nothing. We can be praying five times a day. Pictures of piety, yes. But we know nothing about the book. So the Christians are taking advantage of that. And they're making inroads into our community. They know that at the back of your mind, so many things you have inherited. You believe, you believe, you believe. You believe that in Jesus? Yes. They come to you, they say, you believe in Jesus? They say, yes. So you know he was one of the mightiest messengers of God? I say, no, no, we accept that. So you know he was born miraculously, without any male intervention? I say, no, no, we believe that. So you know he was the Masih, Masihullah? Say, yes, yes, no, we accept that. Was Muhammad Masihullah? He says, no. But Jesus is Masih? Yes. Your prophet, only Rasul? Say, yes, he's only Rasul. In the Quran? He says, Rasul and Masih, he said, yes. That's what the Quran says. He says, you know, Jesus was born without a father. He said, yes. Mojiza, Mojiza. Was Muhammad born like that? He said, no. See, he's creating in your mind degrees of superiority for Jesus. You know, Jesus gave life to the dead. He said, yes, yes, be Nillah. He said, did Muhammad give life to the dead, be Nillah? He said, no, not that I know. Shh, a degree up higher for Jesus. They have learned new techniques. Where is Jesus? He says, in heaven. He's alive. He said, yeah. He's coming back. He said, yes. Where is your prophet Muhammad? He says, he's buried in Medina. Perhaps his bones have rotted in the grave. The missionary is telling you. He said, no, no, we believe he's Hayatun Nabi. He's the living prophet. Yes, yes, that's metaphysically. But physically, maybe his bones have rotted in the grave. So he said, maybe. So don't you think God had a purpose in doing all that? He does for nothing. Go and argue with him. Talk with him. We are losing. Wallah, we are losing because you are not equipped. So, we said, look, we have answers for this. There are books available. Get them. Books. For this particular field of activity. Books. Christ in Islam answers all those problems. Is the Bible God's word? It answers all your problems. Crucifixion or crucifixion answers your problems. Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, answers your problem and on and on. All these books are available from the Islamic Propagation Center in Birmingham. Get them, master them, and now you go and share with them. You go and knock at the doors. What the Bible says about Muhammad, and on and on. What is his name? Books after books. But the book of all books is the Quran. We have to master this book ourselves. We must know what Allah wants us to do, what he says. And this book is available here, here, in the foyer. You know how much? This book. This encyclopedia of 2,000 pages, you know how much? Five pounds. Five pounds. Wallah is cheap. Wallah is cheap. Dirt cheap. Dirt cheap. If you only know, try and buy a book. I don't know whether you ever purchased any books at all. Because we are not a reading people. Allah makes us Iqra community. First verse of revelation, first word Allah gave our Nabi, He said, Iqra, read. And the Muslim says, La Iqra, we won't read. 
Yeah, he doesn't read. The Muslim is a nation that doesn't read. You know that? Not even newspapers. Look at this. This Bible here. I purchased it from Birmingham. From Hudson's. Newspaper bookshop called Hudson's. This Bible here, I paid £9.95. pence, 10 pounds. 5 pence short of 5, 10 pounds. With VAT, I think it was more than that. For the price of one of this, you get two of this. Five pounds each. 2,000 pages with Arabic text, translation, and commentary. And you owe it to yourself. You know the verse I quoted. Where is it? Go and check up in the Quran. What does Allah say? I said, it is in Surah Baqarah. Where do you find Baqarah? In the Quran, the Indian Muslim, the Pakistani Muslim, the African Muslim. Where do you find book here? In this volume, you open the index. Right at the back, index. Very comprehensive index. And the B, just like in a dictionary, look for Baqarah. And Baqarah will tell you Surah 2, chapter 2. 2 is easy to find because every page is numbered. I said, verse number 120, very easy to find. Open it, check it up, and see what Allah says. Allow Allah by Allah to speak to you direct, not through didat. Let him speak to you direct because he's speaking to you and to me direct in this book. Without Akhi Jibreel. You don't need Akhi Jibreel. He's retired. You don't need him anymore. If anybody tells you he's hearing voices, he needs a psychiatrist. Don't listen to him. Anybody even did that. Anybody tells you, he needs a psychiatrist. Take him over. This book here, Allah talks to you direct. What do you want to know? What do you want to know? You want to know about marriage? In the book. You want to know about divorce? In the book. You want to know about heaven? About hell? In the book. What do you want to know? You want to know about Jesus. Your neighborhood. People talk about Jesus. Jesus. Let him come in. He says, you know what the Quran says about Jesus? He says, no. Open the book. He says, you know what it says? And the J, look at it. Look for it. Look for it. And the J, Jesus. The number of different headings about Jesus in the Quran. Everything on your fingertips. You want to open his birth. Chapter 3, Surah Ali Imran. Chapter 3, verse 42. Read it to him, man. Read it to him. You can't do that much for yourself and for Islam. You deserve to get absorbed. You deserve to get lost. Willy nilly, you can't help it, you'll be gone. Wallah, if not you, your children will be gone, gone to the dogs. You owe it to yourself that you wake up, take up this book of God, and wallah, it is so cheap, wallah, it'll improve your English. Your English will improve. You don't have to read Shakespeare or Milton to improve your English even. Read this book and get closer to Allah's kalam. Then you know that Allah is telling you to what I'm, what I'm telling you is Ahmadidha talking. That Allah is telling you, call them, Ya Ahl al-Kitab, O people of the book, O Jews and Christians, Ta'ala, come. Are you calling them? No. Why not? Because you don't listen to Allah. If you read it and Allah is telling you, Ta'ala, Allah is telling you, tell them, Wala taqulu salasa, don't say trinity, in tahu khairul lakum, this is stop it, it'll be better for you, innam allahu ilahum wahid, for your Allah is one Allah. Then you'll find who's saying trinity? This is being read in the masjids. In the taraweeh you hear this, our alims are reading, Wala taqulu salasa. Is there any Muslims in our masjid who say salasa? He? No, then who are you talking to? Allah says, Lakat kafar Allah kalu inna Allah wal Masih ibn Maryam. Anyone who says that Jesus Christ, the Son of Mary, is God, is making kufr. It's an act of blasphemy. It's a treason against Allah. Waqal al Masih. But Christ said, Ya bani Israel, O children of Israel, Allah, worship Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbukum, who is my Lord and your Lord. Inna hu man yushrik billah. Whoever will associate anyone with Allah, Fakad haram Allah liyal jannah. Allah will make jannah haram for them. Allah will forbid them paradise. Wa ma'wahu nar. And the fire of hell will be their dwelling place. Wa ma'al is zalimin amin ansar. And for the wrongdoers, there will be no one to help. In the masjid, you find people who say Jesus is God? No. Allah says, tell them, Ya Ahl al-Kitab, O people of the book, La taghlu fi dinikum. He said, do not go to extremes in your religion. You can you get people in your masjid who say, who go to extremes? The Ahl al-Kitab come to your masjids? Ya Bani Israel, Ya Bani Israel, says the Quran. Bani Israel come into your masjids? No. Then what is this? Who are you talking to? Talking to the wall? Mad people talk to walls. You know that? You're not right in your head, you talk to the wall. 
Can you imagine? You come here, there's nobody in the hall, and I'm talking away, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. And... He said, who is this guy talking to? <laughs> he said, no, he's talking to the people. Where? He said, no, no, he's imagining that the people are sitting here. He said, the guy's gone mad, poor fellow. No? In the masjids, we are talking this. Don't say this. Don't do that. But the people are not there in the masjids. It means that the, the instruction is given to you and to me to find these people who are making kufar, find them and bring them to the right path. That's instructions given to you. But we sit on our backsides doing nothing because we don't apprehend the message. Open the book, allow Allah to talk to you. And then you see what happens. If you can sit on your backside doing nothing. When Allah cries in the Quran, and they say that Ar Rahman, the merciful God, has begotten a son, Allah ne beta jana. It's one of the most abominable assertions one can make. The worst swearing you can give Allah is this to say that He begot a son. At it the skies are ready to burst. And the earth to split asunder. And the mountains to fall down in utter ruin. Such horrible swearing they give Allah. And you sit on your backside doing nothing. I'm asking the Arab. I said, you did this? He said, yes. You understand what it means? He said, yes. And you can sit on your backside doing nothing. When they swear Allah, somebody saw your mother, what do you do? You break his jaw. Somebody saw your wife or your sister, what do you do? You'll break his jaw. And if you can't do it, you hire a gang. You say you love Allah more than anything else, and they're swearing and abusing him, and it's nothing, it's a big joke. There's something wrong with your claim. You say you love Allah and his Rasul. May Allah forgive us. My dear brothers and sisters, look, take it upon yourself. Get this book of God. Avail it, read it, and implement it. Get this little booklet, arm yourself, and go to town. This is the opportunity Allah has given us. As much as they feel that they have an opportunity against you, you have the same opportunity against them. You don't have to go to foreign lands. They are here. Your customers are also here. You don't have to go to foreign lands to go and deliver the message. You don't have to learn his language. It's already he knows the language. You know his language, he knows your language. Look, whatever he said about you, it applies in reverse. Same thing what he's boasting about, you can do the same thing what he wants to do to you, you can do to him. And it's, Allah has given us this opportunity. We hope that we take it up and fulfill the duties and obligations which Allah has put upon us. With these words, I'm very grateful to the Jamaat here, Blackburn, for giving me this opportunity. And may Allah guide us all. Wa akhirul da'wana and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, now uh, this will be followed by uh, question time. So anybody who has a question <coughs> should uh, just ask uh, about the question to pertain to the subject. And, uh, and uh, the questions uh, should be asked uh, one by uh, each person, and the uh, questions should be asked one by one. Please maintain the highest standard of discipline. And if you have got any questions to ask to Brother and the leader, you can ask them. Thank you. So, can I stand to say in total, please? No. If you understood my English, did you understand my English? Well, I understand the problem. If you understood, I think. No, no, I just. There are many You see, I have caught up on the phone. Did you do business? I will give you an example, and if we have time, that the Christian missionaries dressed like you, you know, with the shamish and kalwar, salwar, they come along and say, you know, uncle, I like to ask you a question in Urdu, so, so I feel compassion for the man, and the guy makes a fool of me, because I don't know the language. So, please. Master, it says a 
this is the Talaq from Yemen. And he said, this is not Islam. Islam says, Allah, the Quran is over. You know, I, I know this verse is mentioned in a few places in France. But has anybody connected this verse with divorce? Uh, I think, you see now, what happened in Nelson, you quoting here, you were given opportunity there to ask questions, which you didn't ask, right. So now we have to explain in what context was this verse quoted, Allah means no bearer of a burden bears the burden of another. Right. Where does it fit in with talaq? No, it doesn't fit in with talaq there, but I says, now nah, you made the mistake. You divorced your wife in anger. You. Now you're going to punish your wife to go and sleep with an old man. Where is your sense? I'm asking, where is your brains that you made the mistake and your wife must go and sleep with another man to purify her for you? So I said, look, the law of Allah says that no bearer of a burden bears the burden of another. It was your burden. We should have punished you, make you to sleep with some sodomite, you know, some gay, instead of that poor woman. Please, please, Silence, please, please don't do that. Look, this, is, uh, this was the feeling that I had when I uttered the words that no bearer of a burden bears the burden of another, meaning you, you make the mistake, you pay for it. That's the law of Allah in the Quran, not your wife. See? So in that sense, the connection was about punishing the wrong person. What is the muscle for, uh, for this? See? Shh, no, please, brother. brother. Look, I spoke for more than an hour. Shh, 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 shh. Look. Give me one, two minutes more. All right. All right, give him two minutes. Shh. What have you got? Just keep a little far. Keep the mouth far from there, yeah. <laughs> now, sir, shh. Look, I can't, the thing, the sound, yes. Go ahead, go ahead, my son. You're talking about Christians destroying Islam. Islam is being destroyed. We have got these movies. They're destroying Islam themselves. The new generation is being confused by this. How come it's going to be the new generation. Yes. 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 You see, the way to unconfuse them is to take them to the Quran. Take them to the Quran. In other words, now you have to know the Quran. I quoted the Quran. Allah's law says that whatever you do, you pay for it. Right? Now that is a principle, eternal principle with Allah. You bring me anybody, now man, what a great alim he is. He says, no, you commit rape and murder and somebody else gets punished for it. I says, no, I can't accept. Allah says, Allah taziru waziratun wizra ukhra. Bibi Aisha Siddiqa, she said that, you know, that there is current among the Muslims an idea that if a person dies and the woman, she wails and complains and she cries, the deceased person gets punishment. So in answer to that, she quoted this verse. In Aisha Siddiqa, the Ummul Mumineen, our mother, she quoted this verse. Where it says, now the woman is crying and the husband is getting punished. One who's dead. So she says, Allah taziru waziratun wizra ukhra. Now mind the whole Ummah says that the man is getting punished. The husband, for the woman crying. 
Allah says, she says, Allah says, no bearer of a burden is a burden. If the woman is guilty for crying, complaining to Allah, then she will be punished, not the man, not the deceased. That is the law and we have to accept it. No arguments. You come along with this and that and say, look, these are your ideas. You are prepared to talk. You call me. This alim that you have in mind, you bring him to me and I want him to answer this. That you make the mistake and your woman pays for that. That, I said, look, it doesn't enter my mind. Explain to me how. So you see, so the thing is, we have to go to the Quran. Once you go to the Quran, Wallah, this is the common denominator. That will unify us, whether Tablighi or Sunni or whatever. If you want to unite people, you need a common denominator. At the moment, you have your hero. You want to know what your hero says. I want to tell you, say, my hero says this. Therefore, there's a conflict. If we have our hero, Muhammad as our hero, and this book of guidance as our book of principles, inshallah, this will bring us all together. No, 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 there's no conflict. When I tell you Allah says this, no conflict. Can you see now? Whatever I'm talking about, this is what Allah says. You can't tell me, say, Hamara mazhab ye kata hai. my mazhab says, I say, look, excuse me, Allah says this in the Quran. What have you to say to that? Your Sheikh, I want to know what he says about this. So this is the common denominator that can bring Muslims together. Allah's kalam. That's what I'm urging everybody to do. Go to the book of God. Books we have plenty. And the books have divided us. Our heroes have divided us. Go to Allah's kalam and Allah's kalam will unite us. This is the rope of Allah. Allah says, Hold fast to the rope of Allah which is stretched out for you and don't be divided among yourselves. This is the rope. We are not holding the rope. Nobody reads the rope. Nobody reads the book. Tell me what this book says about talaq. What this book says? There is a whole surah in this Quran called Surah Talaq. Since you touched it, the whole surah called talaq. Talaq means divorce. Allah bari ta'ala spells out for us in detail. If you must, you reach the stage where you and your wife can't agree. Then it sets in motion, it tells you what, 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 step number one, step number two, step number three, step number four. What to do before you can say, I divorce you over a period of three months. He is telling you what to do. You won't listen, you, you didn't read the Quran. You're not listening to Allah's kalam. And now you go along and say, talaq, talaq, talaq. I say, where did you get that? Is that what Allah told you in this Quran to do? Now, you made a mistake, you say. You made a mistake. Now you have to find a remedy. So you created a remedy worse than the sickness. So now I'm talking. I said, look, this is not reasonable. Now you want to bring about the mazhabs. And the ajmai, now there's Urdu. He wanted to speak in Urdu. I said, look, please, brothers. I don't know this language. I know this. What they call, we call it, you know, fana kolo, aisa, taisa, hum baat kar sakta hai. But now, otherwise you're going to make a fool of me. Ijma, umma, as in all this, what it means. I know what Allah says, and this is what I understand. If I'm wrong, you correct me, that I don't understand the Quran, as I should. Yes, brother, what have you got? I received them in South Africa, I received them in Pakistan. Uh, I, I don't know really whether they have reached your people yet. But you are a target for it. Everybody, every Muslim anywhere. See, it depends on the Christian missionaries. If they feel that, look man, this Bengali Muslim or this Punjabi Muslim, you know, he needs it, it's available to them. I won't tell you where they are, but they are available. They can write and they can get them and they can give out to the Muslims. So it depends on the missionary, what he's thinking. They have, here as well, since they're already found also in the UK. Thank you. You know, amazing, this little young man, look at the contribution he made. This little fellow. Look, the question he asked, on, based on things that I've spoken, he said, now he wants to know, it makes some sense. Instead of taking you back, what happened in Nelson? I don't know when. 